so my talk today is going to be on nutrition should be simple not stressful and that's I should be listening to that because now I'm very stressed and nervous so I just have to calm down okay so what we're going to be talking about today quickly is unleashing the species appropriate diet from the Western research box looking at empirical proof in thousands of real-life cases compared to our Western controlled laboratory studies and basically prevention through nutrition, the concept of synergistic mycophytonutrients and their ability to benefit each body's individual needs compared to the overall Western nutritional guideline of one size fits all. And a cell is a cell is a cell. I say that so many times. So whether you're a dog, a cow, a cat, a horse, a human, it doesn't really matter. What causes cell death is essentially the same for everybody. The difference is that is in susceptibility and how the disease cell manifests in each body. The key to this is prevention through nutrition. So what I just wanted to say quickly before we go on is that I'm just, I'm gonna really go through this really fast. Julia did an awesome job at trying to make my really, really long slides into uh, bullet points because I try to just give as much information as possible. So if I really talk fast, everybody can go back at any time and look at these slides. Uh, before we begin the actual nutritional part is just remember if your dog's gut is not healthy no matter what food you feed it it will not support the dog's health and longevity so many of my colleagues say that they have clients that have been on raw food for years but their dogs are still itchy or their problems haven't been solved in these cases all of us agree that usually what's happening is it's a gut health issue Gut trauma, some people don't believe or have not even heard of leaky gut. So let's just call it gut trauma. We've all witnessed trauma, right? So joint trauma you can see with your dog limping, skin trauma you can see with lesions or wounds, but gut trauma you just can't see it. So because you can't see it, you don't fix it. So it's left injured and then it becomes a chronic problem and it shows up in so many different forms like allergies, autoimmune disease, thyroid disease, etc. The simple scoop is any dogs that have had antibiotics, flea or tick medication, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or actual steroids, vaccinations or years of dry kibble, you can pretty much guarantee that your dog has some form of gut trauma. So we're going to go through really fast and I promise after a quick history lesson of uh, what dog, like commercial dog food's all about and some foundational information, I'll simplify all of this at the end. When I was asked to speak to, for a raw roundup, I really had to ask myself this question. What could I bring to the table that may add to all the brilliant research and amazing information that you're going to be hearing this weekend and you are going to be hearing tons? Simply the answer is, is my professional experience and empirical proof with raw food. As homeopaths, we're highly trained to be, have keen observation. Adding that to owning my own veterinary hospital using homeopathy as our primary modality for patients that can't speak, that keen sense of observation of health has to even be more deeply integrated. So my experience to draw from, from that picture of those puppies in that dog, their fifth generation, strictly raw, unvaccinated uh, a litter and, and their mama. So my background really fast is I've taught workshops and I've promoted raw food since 1992. In 1994, I developed the first commercially available raw food in Canada. The last 20 years of practice, I've seen over 30,000 animals. I've followed thousands of dogs that I've either switched to raw food or really lucky puppies and kittens that we started off with raw food from the get-go. I work strictly with raw food breeders whose contracts require owners to raw feed puppies. I've had a wide range of patients from owners that spent every single monetary amount that they could in every single nutritional additive and supplement known to man to clients that just did the best that they possibly could with the finances that they had. The SAVE guidelines so that I had for everybody was just a little bit strict but it was the same one which is rotation of different types of meat with food containing 50% muscle meat, 10% organs, 15% bone, 20% full spectrum color vegetables, 5% fruit, essential fatty acids, and recreational bones. My bone content is a little bit low, but I've seen historically dogs getting constipated. So if you follow their poop, you can add, you can add extra bones if you want. In my experience, that's never faltered. So 
when I talk about homeopathy, I really believe that looking at empirical proof is so important. This one dog up above, I, how many times I've heard veterinarians and colleagues say, I don't understand, his blood, look, his blood work looks great, but all his meds are perfect and perfectly dosed, but he looks terrible. And then below, the other picture of this dog, that's crazy, his blood, blood work looks so crappy, but he looks amazing. So we gotta look at the actual animal or the person. Empirical proof is means provable or verifiable by experience or depending on experience or observation alone without using scientific method or theory, especially in medicine. Observation and experience of thousands of dogs through my veterinary clinic is how I really feel. I have empirical proof. The reason is, is it wasn't, I haven't just given these dogs this food and never seen them again or seen them once a year or just sort of when they come in. They've had follow-ups through my, my veterinary hospital. They've had blood work, biannual checkups. Some of these dogs' lives were completely turned around by raw food. Others just went from surviving to thriving. The only exceptions of that basic diet is that in extreme cases of pathology where the diet had to be tailored, such as cancer, structural liver function, kidney failure, etc. But my overall experience in clinical practice is that these dogs thrive on this basic raw food diet. Um, nutrition is the foundation of health, and that's one comment that everybody's going to agree with. But with rising consciousness comes a mass of knowledge, advice, recommendations, opinions, and many people are left feeling overwhelmed and confused. I'm not trying to reduce the importance of research or science at all. My goal here today is to help dog owners to feel, that do feel stressed with all of that information. However you choose to support your dog's health through nutrition, it's going to be an evolution of learning. The mere fact that you're watching Raw Roundup right now guarantees that your dogs are in better hands and probably receiving better nutrition than most dogs on the planet. So for all of you out there that are going, oh my gosh, which one do I do? What do I do? Just take a second and really honestly breathe and let that sink in that you're here. Really, you're, you're, you're doing an amazing job already just by sitting here and listening. So through chaos, and ge through chaos, genius is created and evolutionary breakthroughs happen, bringing us back to an awareness steeped in tradition and experiential, experiential knowledge. We're reverting back to unprocessed food, real food, non-GMO, non-synthetic vitamins, and whole food nutrition. For very compromised animals in my clinic, I would re not just research um, what's going on with the dog, but I'd actually look at where their country of origin was, what would be as far as diet goes, what would what prey would they be eating according to their size? Are they a German Shepherd size? Are they a, you know, Italian Greyhound size? Would they be eating a diet dense in fat or small lean rodents? What would the rodents or prey in that country even be eating and in what seasons? Humans are now realizing that diets consumed by whom we considered at one time peasants were in fact some of the most nutritional diets ever like seasonally prepared and fermented fruits and vegetables like sauerkraut, foods planted and raised on their farms and grown locally by their neighbors. So why did we come up with this uh, recommended daily allowance? Well, it happened from, it was developed in, uh, during World War II to investigate issues of nutrition that might affect national defense. Food was scarce and eating a variety of food in combat just wasn't possible. Allowances or guidelines were created because of a very real fear that the soldiers would become sick or weak and not by not eating a balanced diet. The RDA was not created for people living well and eating a basic, basic healthy diet. So it just started out of the need because of war, not because of the need that people were sick. The same hold true, holds true for our dogs. In 1860, watching dogs on the docks of the shipyards eat hardtack, which is like a wheat-based product, James Spratt came up with the idea of dog cakes. His entrepreneurial brain sort of just kicked in and he decided that he was gonna make dog biscuits and he created the first ever dog food company. This is awful, but American, after when America was recovering from World War I, the focus was not on pets, but on how to put food on the tables for their families, which is understandable. Dog food made its way into the market at that time because it was a cheap carbohydrate and for immediate energy in a difficult time. It was not meant to go on forever. 
After the war, horses that were used to fight our freedom were de deemed unwanted and un an unwanted expense, which is so sad because they should have been heroes, but they were sold for glue, gelatin, and pet food. Once this cheap horse meat ran out, pe pet food makers switched to buying meat that was basically unfit for human consumption and garbage. So probably our first uh, professional raw food advocate for animals was Dr. Pottinger. He did a research that started off with people doing adrenal extracts on tuberculosis and asthma. He started to realize that nutrition played a huge role in individuals' health. His feeding experiments on cats from 1932 to 1942, he investigated the effects of cooked food diets compared to a basic raw meat, raw milk diet on generations of cats. His findings were that cats that were fed raw diet possessed strong teeth and bones, had uncomplicated births and good weights, low mortality, and above all, they lived largely disease-free, if you can imagine. His findings were the opposites for cats fed a cooked diet. Cats eating cooked food exhibit progressive aller allergic symptoms from generation to generation, most commonly being respiratory, gastrointestinal, affecting the entire immune system, and skin disorder, which was, is kind of interesting, isn't it, when we think now what we're looking at with allergic responses and, and uh, immune system diseases with our dogs. AVCO, okay, so AVCO is an American feed control official. They established in 1909. They don't regulate, even though people think that they do, but they don't. They don't regulate, test, or approve, or certify pet foods. It's up to the manufacturers themselves to follow the guideline. Dr. Billinghurst is going to be talking about that, and it's going to be amazing, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time for sure. But what I did want to talk about is how short uh, AVCO falls in ignoring the real concern of endotoxins. Endotoxins are found in large amounts of commercially made pet foods. Meat sources not fit for human consumption um, is a big one. No testing requirements for the to these toxins are, um, are needed. Serious health consequences come from these toxins for, uh, for your dogs. And honestly, for me, it's just another way to discard waste that's consistent with our food history if we look back with the war horses and then the, the tack and the, all that stuff. So really, balanced nutrition, the, the word balanced nutrition, in my opinion, is just a red herring to avoid the true real issue that dead processed food provides no nutritional value on its own. So where does this leave us with uh, our canine diets now? Out of the chaos of war, big pharma, TV dinners, microwaves, and lean cuisine, human nutrition is bringing us back to real food. Dogs have gone through glorified dog cakes, horse meat, rendered meats unfit for human consumption meats, endotoxin, the malamine scares, the veterinary diet scandals. Now we're coming back to a common sensible notion that a cell is a cell is a cell, whatever the species. Processed food is devoid of amazing fats, micronutrients, enzyme, antioxidants, which is our sort of anti-rusting agents, and microbes. So mycophytonutrients, the concept of synergistic mycophytonutrients and their ability to benefit each body's individual needs compared to overall Western nutritional guidelines of one size fits all. Nutrients, balanced whole nourishment keeps the body healthy. Missing certain nut nut nutritional elements over time leads to malfunction. We can supplement, like lots of words out there, supplementing this, supplementing that, but supplementing means exactly that. It's addition to, not instead of. Synthetic supplements don't supply life-sustaining nutrients found in whole foods. It just doesn't. The World Health Organization says that micronutrients are named that because you're only needing minuscule amounts of these substances and there, there are magic wands that enable the body to produce enzymes, hormones, and other substances essential for proper growth and development. As tiny as the amounts are, however, the consequences of their absence is very severe. Nutrients. So focusing on a lack of a few micronutrients is a very, to me, non-holistic approach. 
And what I mean by is just looking at vitamin D or just looking at the lack of, of manganese or just looking at the lack of anything is just taking one of the pieces of the puzzle. Nutrients work in synergistically much smaller amounts and in ways that science actually doesn't even fully understand. Synthetic vitamins can't even compare to the way whole food or whole plant achieves overall balance. Science is just now starting to realize that plant intelligence can benefit, benefit in ways that we aren't even measuring yet. Macronutrients and micronutrients. So macronutrients are your protein, fats, carbohydrates, and they supply your energy in form of calories. And they're pretty easy to keep track of. But our micronutrients, which are vitamins and minerals, support our biochemical process in our bodies. Tracking micronutrients in your dog's diet can be pretty stressful. Many official recommendations are based on how much each nutrient is needed to avoid deficiencies. It's not really an overall thing. Therefore, most of these goals are flawed. Keep in mind, people and animals have thrived for a millennium not, to, not even knowing what vitamins were, much less how to measure them. If we needed to track and control every single nutrient to the last microgram, we would have died off a long time ago. Avoiding toxins and feeding most dogs a quality raw diet that is species-specific, species nutrient-rich with tons of variety will meet their nutritional needs. Why am I so confident that dogs can get what they need from, the basic, from this basic concept? Well, let's see what simple meat, bones, organ, veg, fruit, and essential, essential fatty acids provide. So we all know that meat contains protein and fat. Bone contains mineral like, uh, minerals like calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and chewing bones actually stimulates endorphins, which means it reduces stress, it supports adrenal function, and helps relieve boredom and reduces pain. Feeding your dog liver is almost like giving them a multivitamin. It's high in protein, packed with vitamin A, B6, B12, folate, iron, phosphate, which is phosphorus, zinc, copper, and selenium. Cholesterol in the liver also helps to synthesize their vitamin D. It can be expensive, so an easier, less uh, cost-effective way, you can do heart, kidney, tongue, brain, and they also provide more micronutrients than traditional muscle meat. For example, heart contains vitamin B, thiamine, folate, selenium, phosphorus, and zinc. Kidneys have vitamin C, B12, selenium, iron, zinc, copper, riboflavin, and riboflavin and phosphorus. Other organ meats, including tongue, tripe, and gizzards or brains are all amazing. The best place though to get your organ meat is from a butcher that you trust. So vegetables and plants, they contain micronutrients, which are vitamins and minerals, and they contain macro, macronutrients, carbohydrates, but they also contain phytonutrients. So phytonutrients protect the plant from excess ultraviolet radiation pests, toxins, and pollution which cause free radical damage within the cells. Free radicals can bind and damage cell proteins, cell membranes, and even their DNA. Consuming phytonutrients will provide protection from your dog, for your dog's cells. All plants contain different phytonutrients, so feeding a variety of plants and vegetables can boost this protection, hence why we want full spectrum color, because that means you're giving variety. Some additional tips, if you can leave roots, stems, leaves on your plants and vegetables, so long as they're edible and non-toxin, they are incredible because they're the highest concentration of the microbial population, which is phenomenally important and nutrition for, nutritional for the gut. So essential fatty acids. I haven't been recommending fish oil for dogs for a pretty long time. Um, I use phytoplankton now. Phytoplankton is actually the food that fish eat that makes fish oil nutritious. It's a marine superfood and antioxidant. There's no concern for rancidity like the oil does. It's fully sustainable, doesn't deplete our oceans, marine mammals, or fish. It contains no toxins. It provides DHA, EPA, LA, and NLNA. Um, it's, a, it's a single cell, the most complete food nutrition really that I've ever worked with. And I've worked with a lot of whole food nutrition, but this, this really surpasses all of it. It contains essential fatty acids as well as phytonutrients, superoxide dismutase, amino acids, micronutrients, and protein. 
So, but we have to remember though, this is not kelp. Uh, phytoplankton is very different. I use a rotation of that and I use coconut oil and hemp oil. No, I'm sorry, I use, a, I use phytoplankton all the time, but then I use coconut oil and, and hemp oil in a rotational way to get the me medium chain fatty acids. So these are some foods that are easy to add and uh, they're optional. So mussels and clams give uh, vitamin B, high levels of vitamin C, A, riboflavin, niacin, iron, phosphorus, zinc, and copper, manganese, and selenium. Bone broth is helpful for leaky gut and it has an amazing source of collagen and gelatin and it supports your connective tissue in the body. It's hugely beneficial in the gut that's been damaged from the overuse of drugs. It also contains nutrients like minerals, calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus. Seaweed, real whole dry seaweed is a great way to get iodine into your dog. Definitely the um, Atlantic seaweed does have uh, higher iodine than the rest of the, the ocean seaweeds. Iodine is essential for micronutrients that support cell met metabolism and it's healthy for your thyroid or their thi thyroid function. Some dogs will eat pieces as treats, but it's easier, you know what, you can just actually add it to your bone broth. So fermented foods like pre and probiotic supports beneficial gut flora so that all those amazing nutrients we just spoke about can actually be processed and absorbed. Digestive enzymes aid in digestion and absorption of nutrients, helps to break down large particles of food that could bypass the gut lining if it's, if it's stretched and cause inflammatory response. Vitamin D. So the risk of vitamin D is there, um, and we, knew, we do really know the associated diseases that come with that, but I still really, really recommend that you use it through food and not supplements. Unless your dog's been shown that it has, for sure, low vitamin D levels by blood tests, um, then you can do the supplement, but please continue to recheck the levels because if it goes too high, it's just as bad as too low. So once the levels are normal though, please go back to doing sardines, beef liver, and egg yolks are great sources of vitamin D. So now let's put all of this into sort of a simple perspective. Feeding rules. So a simple daily diet of 75% meat, bone, and organ, which I had the, which is on the other slide, 20% colorful vegetables, 5% fruit, and you rotate your proteins. I also do recommend giving a saltwater fish, but not from the Pacific once a week. Essential fatty acids, phytoplankton, and a rotation of coconut and hemp oil. You just do one jar and then switch onto the other jar and then back. And then recreational bones, feet, back, necks, femurs, knuckles, two to three times per week. Um, rotate, pulse, and support foods. Life is easy. It does not have to be. I'm, I know I'm going through this fast, and it sounds like there's a lot, but if you just rotate it, it's really, really easy. You can make a bone broth with seaweed, use it up. Then the next week, give, or the next few days, give a prebiotic and use that up, pre and probiotic. Then you can start an enzyme, use that up. Then maybe a liver support, use that up. Do a turmeric paste, use that up. And then go back to the beginning. Keep it super simple. Go through a container at a time and then you switch. Feeding is like, feeding like this prevents medicinal herbal, herbal overload in the body. Yes, it supports all the functions over time and it keeps you sane. Uh, additions, if you only if you want to, you can do one to three eggs per week, one for a small dog, two medium, three for giants. You can go through a can of sardines over two or three days, or you can try some mussels, tripe depending on your dog's size, one tablespoon for 30 pounds. So your lifestyle and how it fits into raw feeding, which, which I think is very important. So for those of you that are the passionate home chefs, People who are passionate about nutrition or food for themselves and want to share the experience with their dogs. You know, for you guys, this is, this is kind of a no-brainer. You guys cook from scratch each day. You make sure that you balance your own diet and the proteins by combining them over the week. You make smoothies each morning and you add your turmeric and your whole food nutrition. You guys have it down to a science and you never falter. You even send whole food nutritional snacks to sleep over for your kids. You sneak pop, organic popcorn and coconut water into the movie theaters. Honestly, for you guys, do everything. Do mussels, do rounds of amino acids and spices, antioxidants and herbs. Be creative, as creative as you can. Your dog's world is just 
your dog's world is his oyster when you're filling his bowl. But please, please rotate, rotate, rotate. Don't over herbalize. I know that sounds funny, but you shouldn't be adding thousands of things every single day to your dog's your dog's food. Herbs and nutritional supplements like that, they shouldn't, that's not how they were made. So or or research. They're 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 meant to to um, support a function and then change. So rotate, stop, and then start. Health conscious feeders, who are you guys? So you guys are the ones that know what foods are healthy, what foods aren't healthy, what foods have any oxidants in them. Sometimes you're meticulous and sometimes you just fall off the wagon. At home, your kids eat like you, but at hockey rinks or parties, they can eat just like the other kids, but you balance your nutrition and your lifestyle. For you guys, this is really easy. Just find a commercially raw food that's as close to the 7, 75, 20, and 5. I add phytoplankton for a synergistic balance of, micro, of antioxidants, micronutrients, minerals, and phytonutrients. Add your oils. Done. Keep your six, uh, four to six rotational foods in your freezer or your cupboard and rotate as the jars end. When you have two left, just stock up. Your rotational one at a time support can look like this. So you can have a little cupboard, you can have a milk thistle or a dandelion for liver support, you can have a turmeric paste, a pre and probiotic, a digestive enzyme, you can have a, a can or a frozen thing of oysters and mussels, and you can have some bone broth. If something new comes on the market, you can try it, but just make sure that you're not repeating the same thing. So example, if a new type of liver support comes on, then cancel your, cancel your, uh, your milk thistle rotation. So then you have the guys that are the barely I have time to feed myself, but I love my dog feeder. So these are the groups of people that are soccer moms, dads, entrepreneurs, and sadly larger the part of, part of the public today. Finding a commercial raw food, um, you guys should find a commercial raw food that's 75, 20, and 5. Add phytoplankton again. Um, add your oils, and then just go play with your dog. Just forget about all the additives, but only thing I can say for you guys that are really busy and just don't know what to add, if you just do the basics, like I said, the phytoplankton and your oils, then just, just be aware. Be, pay attention and observe your dog. If they look to, like they're getting dandruff or they look like they're a little you know, slower or they, you look a little stiff or they look a little stiff, you, then you can start adding some extras. But don't, don't stress about it. Um, the next one is the money is a real issue feeder. So you guys have zero reason to feel bad about this. Nobody should be fit, feeling bad that they can't feed what they would love to be able to feed because of finances. This is where sourcing chicken backs and necks will supply your meat and bone and fat. Um, then you can get some on sale gizzards and you can add that to your muscle meat. This will give you your 75% protein ratio mix very inexpensively. You can stock up on vegetables and fruits that are marked down, and you just freeze them in the 20%, 5% ratio. Add your hemp oil, which is really, really reasonable, and just feel incredibly proud that you're providing your dog with real food and whole food nutrition. So exciting times. This is actually one of my dogs jumping up. <laughs> food is one of, our, one of your dog's most exciting times of the day, or at least it should be. Your energy around that makes a difference. If you're stressed, it's not going to make for fun times. Just like human nutrition, there are many import, there are many opinions about dog nutrition which will constantly evolve every single year. Your dog is your family, and often the best way to approach his diet is to incorporate into those philosophies that we just talked about. If it's in, if it's in the way that you're feeding, then you're going to be way, way less stressed out. Often the love for your dog will wind up enhancing in their own, your own way of eating. I can't tell you how many clients and how many times I've sat across from people and they've said to me, I wish I had someone feeding me as well as I feed my dog. I would be so much healthier. The love for your dog often winds up changing the way you eat because you're on a path to keep your soulmate alive for as long as you possibly can, cancer-free, or heal them from something that's been a repeated stress in their lives like skin allergies. So now let's just quickly go through some dog categories. This is a little dog that, that I treated. That's my old, the top one's a geriatric dog. The healthy dog's the one in the corner. And um, the, the one with the skin dog is a little client of mine. So different feeds for different needs. 
if there's no real health issues, then just go with your 75, 20, and 5, and then follow your lifestyle category that fits the very best for you. Like I said, you can go back to the slides and look at those. If you have an allergy dog, oh, man, just the same ratios as the 75, 20, and 5, but you've got to heal their gut. Until their gut's healed, you can try a novel protein, one single meat source that you know for sure your dog has never had, preferably a wild game like venison, bison, rabbit, or pheasant. This will help to eliminate some of the inflammatory reactions. Stay on that one protein only, though. That includes treats, supplements that contain animal protein, like real beef flavor. Actually, look at your supplements and see if that actually contains something that's protein. Once your gut is healed, or the, the your once your dog's gut is healed, you can start to reinduce other foods. Lots of antioxidants and essential fatty acids, phytoplankton, and products specifically for leaky gut. Arthritis again, the seventy-five the same ratio. Work on healing the gut because if the gut is inflamed, that inflammation can traumatize is traumatized and it creates the arthritis or any disease to get worse. So if there's inflammation in the dog's body and it's manifesting in any way, it could be autoimmune, look, you could be thinking of Cushing's, you could be looking at, like I said, arthritis or skin allergies. If that gut is unhealed, that inflammatory re response is going to be 10 times inflamed in the area that the animal or the dog is susceptible to. Part of the protocol of, of the, heal, the leaky gut protocol that I have, it has collagen in it. So it's probably one of the main components for joints. So call it, if the collagen is lacking in the gut, chances are it's really going to be lacking in their joints. So you can give them lots of bone broth for collagens, mussels, oysters, antioxidants, and lots of essential fatty acids. Again, once the, duck, the gut is healed, then you can go back to your rotational phase. So geriatric dogs, depends on the dog and what you consider geriatric. To me, it's over 12 with large breed dogs and over 15 with small breed dogs. Very old dogs that are showing increased liver or kidney values may need to uh, actually cook their food because of the geriatric loss of scent and taste. You may need to decrease the meat ratio by replacing part of the muscle meat with eggs and raw dairy proteins that are easier for the dog to digest. Sometimes, even the addition of grains may be necessary. Genetically compromised dogs. So do those are dogs that are born with uh, a functional abnormality. For example, hepatic microvascular dysplasia, where it's, uh, the vessels are actually microscopic and underdeveloped. These dogs in the wild would not be surviving. So moving outside the box is often necessary. Sometimes they're on vegetarian diets even, or ratios of a of less than 30% meat. Grains. I don't believe grains in general for dogs at all. I don't think that they should be eating grains, but like I said, that sometimes we, we have to look outside the box. If we go there, I only recommend non-GMO sprouted grains. Um, when, spring, when grains are fed unsprouted, they have a very high concentration of lectins. Lectin is the plant's natural defense against invaders such as mold or parasites. The problem with lectins are their sugar binding proteins that when they're attached to your dog's digestive lining, it can damage their gut, causing inflammation, trauma, and leaky gut. Nutrition. Okay, so this might seem very simple or even archaic to our scientific world of raw food feeding, but from my 20 years of experience, it's something I can offer with confidence to help your dogs flourish. Again, if your dog has cancer or a life-threatening illness, please work with a holistic nutrition nutritionist or expert on incorporating different foods and different, different ways of using food as medicine. So a question I'm often asked is my own philosophy with my own kids, my patients, my family, my friends, and this is how it goes. The foundation is make sure your gut and your animal's gut is healthy and basically not leaking. This is a, a touchy subject, but I choose ethical meat hands down over grass-fed, antibiotic-free, or even organic. We've proven that the fear and the stress response of factory-raised animals increase the cortisol and adrenaline and is stored in their meat, and it's extremely detrimental to you and your dog's health. I believe truly in my heart that the studies that are showing our increase of cancer 
surrounding me, consuming me, is really, really directly related to that. I just, it's, I feel that that factory farm, I know that Rodney said that that's kind of where I went, and I really, I really do. I feel that it's, it's where we see the endotoxins, the animals sitting in their own feces. I see it with what they're fed. I see it with um, how they're treated. Animals' lives are important. It doesn't matter if it's just, if it's your dog. I feel that every animal's life should be equally as respected and protected. Um, I recommend as, no, as, many, as much non-GMO as you possibly can and toxic free vegetables and fruits as possible. I believe that food and love is a medicine of longevity. Uh, homeopathy is my primary medical modality. And if you're dealing with a life-threatening disease or incur incurable syndromes, the, the use of nutraceuticals, which are a natural substance that have been modified produced to produce a specific health benefit, is necessary and life-saving and can give back quality of life. I don't consider nutraceuticals a synthetic vitamin. Uh, because it's being used for a specific thing. We're not using synthetic vitamins as a multi-daily vitamin. We're using it to support something of ill health, something that's actually been broken. But at the same time, I always use the complementary energy of a whole entire herd to help the body heal in ways that are deeper, but often slower in action and still not really fully understood by Western conventional science of how powerful they are. So the other thing that I, I just need to say is that when it comes to, to nutrition, sometimes we need to ask ourselves, are we spiraling out of control by overanalyzing, supplementing, and filling our dogs full of altered, genetically modified, manipulated, and chemically extracted products that are devoid of plant energy and its intelligence, making it a fraction of what they would be in nature? In my life in general and with my patients and my own animals and the people that I love, what I just try and say is to try to just keep things simple, as clean as you possibly can, as kind as you can, and as, as whole. So that's it. I don't even know if I was too fast or too slow. or um, But thank you so much for, for listening and holding the love that – we all share so much for all of our animals. Thanks, Julie. And I would say you were just right. Oh, awesome. I wasn't looking at the clock, so I was like, okay. <laughs> Where am I? That's good. So we have, thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. I, we, great talk again. I, I, I'm really happy with, with the talks this year, eh, Julie? I, I just think we hit the jackpot this year, and this has been another great talk. Um, and and we, have, we actually have quite a few questions for you. Um, so do I screen share now? Do I do my screen sharing thing? Take yeah, that off? If you want us to see you, we can take a look at you. Okay. Uh, well, you don't have to look at me, but oh, come on here! Hey, okay, how do I do that again? How did you do that again, Julie? Uh, Just go, go back to Chrome. Go back to Chrome. Yeah. And click on the green button on the left. Again. And click on the green button on the left again. Hey. Okay. There you hey, are. Hi. Okay. <laughs> there she is. All right. I'm gonna jump into the questions for you. Okay. So, um, Fish oil, you, you mentioned that is something that you don't feed anymore. And uh, Kim would like to know what, why, what, what's, what's making you move away from fish oil? Just, it's really, really hard to know um, which companies are extra, extra, extra careful about the rancidity amounts in fish oil. And studies are showing that they're rancid. It's not even how long they've been in a bottle, but they're actually rancid before they before they even go in. The next thing about it is the toxins, right? Like the fish are eating, are eating, you know, uh, a lot of toxins in our oceans now, which is pretty scary. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and then it doesn't, let, and then unlike whole fish, it doesn't have the selenium to prevent, to protect against that too. It doesn't. Yeah, yeah. So I, I moved away from fish oil a long time ago as well. well the the phytoplankton is actually what the fish eat, and they and they when they do it, they actually grow it on ground. So it's 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 nothing like I've ever seen before. It actually is cells, and it's made from the actual plant, and it's grown in tanks without um, without only with sunlight and all the 
Atlantic Ocean water is filtered. So all the toxins and heavy metals are filtered out of it, and then the plankton is actually grown on land. So it's much more, um, it's much safer. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, so oh, there's a good question. Um, okay. If you have a dog with leaky gut, yes. How do you know it's healed? What do you how do you know? So that's a really good question. Yeah. Sym yeah. Symptomatically. So you know what I was talking about empirical proof. We have to use our eyes. I I wasn't trying to be facetious at all. I have seen so. I did an actual full lecture at a veterinary conference, and I showed blood work where animals should be dead, but they're doing amazing. And we've we've really lost our our our, our ability to observe. So you you just have to watch them. You know their energy. Let's say your let's say your your dog still doesn't even have signs of leaky gut, but it has been on steroids or it has been on a lot of antibiotics or over vaccinated. You can do you can heal the gut, and you should see you should see maybe a a, a shinier coat, more energy, maybe even less aggressive. Like they've actually proven that aggression can be stemmed from the gut brain connection. Definitely. Ooh, okay, Rhonda, we'll ask your question there. Um, I have my thoughts on this. Um, <laughs> uh, she says that a lot of uh, the the raw, the, the you know the the prey model feeders say that dogs do not they they're just not equipped with the digestive enzymes for digesting plant matter and, and vegetables. What are your thoughts on that? Well, again, like I'm not I'm not disregarding anybody. I can truly honestly tell you that where I'm coming from is just trying to give you what I've seen with my own eyes. And that is, I mean, it's it's kind of a scary thought. When I when I sold my practice before I moved up to Nova Scotia, I had to have it um uh whatever that's called, they had to had to go through the bank and they had to look at my whole practice. And I've I have actually treated over thirty thousand animals. And I would have to say most of those are, well, I shouldn't say most of them, but over 65% of them have been dogs. Mm -hmm. This is the basic nutritional way that I've, I've approached nutrition with dogs. And I have to say, I haven't seen anything, I've never seen anything negative. I've only seen positive. Do I have to go outside the box when, I, when I'm seeing dogs that in the wild wouldn't even be surviving or or dogs when I just look at them like like Angel, that little dog at the at the beginning. I did. I actually went in and went, okay, well, what you know, what where would what she, what would she have been eating? What would her ancestors be eating? And I've even looked at at working with that, but that's minimal. The average animals, the average dogs that I'm seeing, they do amazing. And I believe that dog. Like I live on a farm. I watch my dogs. I'm I'm anal about watching my animals. It drives my my partner nuts. Okay, well, you just stop watching them. They're fine. So, but I do. I watch them all the time. My dog sits there and eats hay. Yeah. He sits and eats my horse's hay. Yeah. I've, I've seen, we have coyotes. They eat plant material. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. And, and I think that they have to consider too, there's a lot, not that I advocate it, but there's a lot of vegetarian dogs that live well into their 20s. So clearly they can digest it. And the big, giant question mark is should they and how much exactly uh oh no. so if, if you have a dog that is that might be sensitive to sea vegetables or, or ocean-based foods as i'm assuming gabrielle might um what are some sources of iodine that we could look at it's a tough one um again is it the protein in the fish because that's what you have to remember so if your dog is allergic to fish, I'm wondering if that's what she's asking. Is, is, is she sea maybe vegetables. Not? So if, if you have a dog that is sensitive to all sea vegetables, so vegetables. I'm sure she has a history of, of, of feeding this um, mm -hmm. with some issues. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I haven't seen that. But if it's sea vegetables, like if it's actually been tested and it's allergic to kelp or, or something like that, again, the phytoplankton is not, um, it's not algae. So algae tends to see veg. if you're looking at algae as sea vegetables, algae has a, um, it's algae, it's, it's not a vegetable, right? So it's not, it's not growing, it's actually sitting and I would, I would almost 
hazard to say it's almost like a fungus of the sea, right? So it's 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 looked at very differently. Um, I would still I would try phytoplankton because I've been I haven't seen anybody alert or anything allergic to that because getting iodine other than through something like that you can give it you can give it in supplemental but you have to be extremely careful yeah definitely oh oh what a nice question okay do you, <laughs> do you think that leaky gut can be healed with with the proper constitutional remedy or mm -hmm. is it something that that we need to look outside of homeopathy to fix yeah and you know what i mean you can attest to me in homeopathy um i mean homeopathy is and I don't, I don't, I'm it's very hard for me to talk about this because I have that leaky gut protocol, and I think that in that protocol, I have a combination of remedies that I've used specifically to heal the gut. I think that that's like saying, um, you know, if there's a wound, will homeopathy stitch it? Saying that, I've also healed wounds with homeopathy that have been this big that couldn't be stitched and they've healed through through treatment but it, they've also been healed through topical treatments so I, I I would have to say no I don't think it, it's it's healable through constitutional I think we have to come outside the box and do everything okay and I think I, oh yeah no Billy Joe Billy Joe wants to know which remedies and I can answer that real quick work with your homeopath because she'll yeah. pick one of hundreds yeah. <laughs> one of hundreds yeah um, I'm going to finish off with Phyllis's question, and she's consolidating about 85,000 of the same questions. And okay. <laughs> those are. Um, no, no, no. That's a good one. Okay, um, good. So when, when, when they're looking to add phytoplankton sources um, to their foods, are there brands yeah. or sources um, that, that you could recommend for us all? Ah, that's scary. Okay, so we have one. We have one, and the, and the reason that I'm saying there are, like you can Google phytoplankton. Just, just Google it. Uh, Try and make sure that the source is Atlantic source. Make sure that when you're Googling phytoplankton, it's it's grown actually on the ground without any kind of like chemical enhancement, right? So non-GMO, just, just be very careful about what you do. The one that we did, I've worked for a long time. I actually worked with the, with the researcher of phytoplankton and we developed the strain for animals. So it's it's actually different than the human strain. Huh? But just just pay very close attention when you're Googling to make sure that it's it's grown on ground, not in the ocean, because then you're not depleting the ocean. Like I'm so anally ethical. Like I I'm I don't want to, you know, starve seals in order to feed dogs. So and it is actually better because then we can filter it. 